So all ready to go. They're just waiting now for the start to be signalled. Precisely 9.30 by a Royal Artillery 16-pounder. journey of 26 miles 385 yards and as always they go away very very quickly indeed unless of course you're packed at the back and you have to wait your turn last year the start took about seven minutes to clear but really they've got it beautifully organized because the athletes are moving very smoothly indeed a couple of the africans breaking away marvellous adventure this is. This, the third running of the London Marathon. The event so well established now in the sporting calendar of this country. I was delighted to see Ron Hill there, number one. They've given him number one, and that's a great cause for celebration. But Ron is the fastest marathon runner here. He's not going to be figuring amongst them today, but I think it's great that they should recognise Ron's ability and his performances over the years. He's probably been our greatest marathon runner, and knowing him, he'll be up there amongst them, but he certainly won't be figuring like he used to do in the, in the former days. And already we've, we're seeing the race starting to develop. The, the Africans, the Ethiopians and the Tanzanians have gone straight to the front, and I remember they did exactly the same in the Commonwealth Games, those people. Dewey of Tanzania, one of the leaders there. And by the way, the uh, athletes pouring through there at the slow start, uh, the leading ladies already on their way. And don't forget, of course, uh, they've got different routes, but they do converge after three miles. 89, in Dewey. Emil Puttermans is up with the leaders as well. So there, Jim Dingwall of Scotland wearing number 25. And Emil Puttermans of Belgium wearing two is the leader. Up there as well, the two Ethiopians, Balsha wearing 82 and number 85, Kume. 84 also there is Bakila of Ethiopia. So we've got three Ethiopians in the leading group. Number 120, Ortega of Spain. There's the two-mile marker, and we'll get the time in a moment. And the time at two miles, well, it's quite remarkable, a second faster than the leader last year. 9.38, uh, Hugh Jones and the leading group went through last year in 9.39. But that, that's very good, sensible pace, and the conditions here are much better than they were last year. I think the athletes are uh, concerned with staying, conserving their energy now, and really the times at this point of the course don't matter at all. I can see Mike Grattan there, who's probably going to be our leading British contender. He's staying way off the pace. He's ignoring those Ethiopians and Tanzanians. He's not even interested in getting involved yet, and he's probably just jogging along there, feeling quite comfortable and hoping that he can stay out of trouble so that when the race starts after the 20-mile mark, then he go he's going to be in contention there. It's crystal clear these Africans are going to play a major part in this. Uh, the Ethiopians, of course, uh, with a strange preparation, there aren't many marathon runners in the world who'd only arrived the night before, but of course there aren't many cross-country runners who'd run a trial just two days before the World Championships in order to leave one man out. And they made it a genuine racing gate set just to drop one athlete. Talking about that though, David, there aren't any athletes in the world as a mass who are as good as these Ethiopians. So the fact that we've not known about them, we've never heard of some of these people, doesn't really make a great deal of difference. It happens to matter in Europe where they've heard of people because they declare their intentions ahead of time. But with these Ethiopians, you know they're training together, you know they've got their training right, and you know it doesn't really matter if they haven't done anything so far. Got news of the three-mile time, 14.22 for the leaders, right on schedule for last year's pace, which was the fastest ever UK marathon, at two hours, nine minutes, 24 seconds. And there's a field, a small group there, breaking away. Puttimans is two, also there, 82 is Balsha of Ethiopia, 85 is Kume of Ethiopia, and 84, Bakila of Ethiopia. So three Ethiopians in the first four. Meanwhile, we've got a very late starter indeed down there. <laughs> and 
that is the last person through the start. The police following that last runner. And after that, the road will be open once more. There's a massive job of organisation. Let's have a look now at the uh, leading groups on the uh, helicopter shot. And that is the point where the two packs merge. Now, they run on either side of the dual carriageway for about another half mile. And then they merge after that. Coming from the top of the shot, that's the uh, ladies' pack and the slower men. Merging now with the... Uh, Athletes who are trailing from the fast uh, start. The leading group, as we saw them go through there, that joining point, there were three Ethiopians joined by Emil Putterman. But I, I just get the sense that we're in the, we've seen this all before. We saw in the World Cross country the Ethiopians dominate as they did. We've seen these before in major championships. And Emil Putterman is leading them along and he's been tracked. He's, they've probably been instructed because they really follow their coach's instructions. They've probably been instructed to follow Putterman and move with everyone that moves alongside. On the outside there, in the white vest, is Malcolm East, who's the leading Briton at the moment. He's been training in America and he's come back for this one effort to make the team for the World Championships. The last man, merely, meanwhile, happily on his way. He's 77, by the way, Francis O'Sullivan. And as a member of Hernhill Harriers, one of the famous clubs based in London. Yeah. By the Kenny Farthing Rider, I think we saw last year. Meanwhile, a real battle developing in front, and a British athlete showing for the first time, and that is Malcolm East. Malcolm East wearing uh, number nine. Just uh, giving you the numbers there, 39 has come into the picture. Uh, that's Jerry Helm, also of England. So Puddiman's there, Bolsher of Ethiopia, Bakile Ethiopia, Kume Ethiopia. Uh, those are numbers 82, 84 and 85. Jerry Helm, 39. Uh, number nine is Malcolm East. Number two, Emil Puddiman's. Second pack uh, includes some more Ethiopians. Washa is there, and Jim Dingwall, I can see, as well, for Scotland. But this leading uh, group looks as though they're trying to get away very early in the race. 39, Jerry Helm of England. St. Helens AC, 26 years of age, and has won three marathons, so this may be a big one for him. Malcolm East, too, an established international. The leaders through four miles and the time at four miles at 19 minutes exactly. Ahead of the uh, athletes, the crowds waiting at Cutty Sock, the first of the famous landmarks just beyond the Naval College. And that's uh, six and a quarter miles. Still they stream through at the joining point. And this really is a brilliant piece of organisation. It's working absolutely perfectly. Incidentally, we've uh, not seen any signs at all of Greta Weitz, who will be up with the leaders on the far side of the road. And indeed, Greta Weitz, if she does break the world record today, which she lost to Alison Rowe, will finish in the first uh, 200 in the race quite easily. Looking at her form in the World Cross Country Championships, though, David, she's got to be uh, capable of doing that. She'd be delighted about the weather because she's really got a thing about hot weather. So she'll have been pleased when she saw the rain coming down this morning. She's got a few pacemakers and men who run around the time she's aiming at who she knows and she's going to run with. So the conditions are set there for Greta. And I certainly hope she uh, runs the way we know she can because she certainly deserves that world record back. That's that marvellous piece of organisation, that merging of the two packs. And the organisation started the day after the last marathon, London Marathon finished. 
It is uh, an incredible piece of work, and it will go on long into the evening. They may be regretting the rainy conditions, but it is salvation for the novices. It really is. And they'll be given good advice. There were all sorts of uh, gatherings yesterday to advise them on what to do. The leading pack now, many of whom have already taken on liquid. They've taken water. Half a million paper cups out there. Another piece of organisation, that, to supply them with water. And the key to that is to take the water long before you feel thirsty. And one hopes that that advice has got to the back. Well, seven athletes there breaking away, about 20 yards clear of the chasing pack. There are three Ethiopians, one Belgian, uh, and two Englishmen, plus Ortega of Spain. Ortega wearing 1-2-0, in terms of style, looking remarkably like Trevor Wright. He does, actually, yeah. He's got, he's got that same kind of roll of the shoulders and the same kind of forward lead. In the lead there is number two, Emil Puttemans, and I know Emil, Emil pretty well. He's one of the most talented athletes in the world, and yet he's probably the most lacking in confidence, as, as has been seen in the times he's run in major championships. And if you look at him, he's looking around, glancing over his shoulder, watching other people's feet, and he's no need of concern at the moment, because they really aren't, they're not racing yet. So uh, he's just showing the nerves, he's just showing the nerves that I think stop him from being one of the great athletes of all time. But maybe the marathon is the event that's going to launch him into that, back into that uh, arena, because he's he's only run one marathon. He ran it in Rome last year, and he won it in two hours ten minutes. So maybe this is his second attempt is going to be um, as successful as his first. Actually, I think Emil has run two, Brendan, but the last one was the fastest. Uh, that was in Rome last May when he did uh, two hours ten minutes uh, fourteen seconds. Uh, in fact, he was faster than that, but the course was remeasured and found to be just over 100 metres short. So we're talking about Puddimans wearing number two. European record holder, of course, on the track and world record holder uh, during his career. Uh, it's interesting there, though, that the leaders have now been caught. Well on the way to uh, Cutty Sark, the first famous landmark, which is at six and a quarter miles. Just another word about Emiel. Puttimans, that is, he's 35 from Louvain. Five foot seven and a half and nine stone. And if you look at that leading bunch of athletes, you'll find they're all fairly lean and mean. There's not a there's not a man over 11 stone there. That's Mike Grattan coming up with a beard. One or two fairly broad-shouldered, but they've been pared down and honed by their training of something like 100 miles a week. There are not too many heavyweights here. My heart will go out to the heavyweights at the back of the field. Who, uh, who were brave to compete and did well. I remember one man I'll be looking out for again who finished the race last year at about 16 stone. He, for me, was an absolute hero. But these, these are the racers. Well, the route uh, filling up. One of the beef eaters at the tower telling a young visitor what's going to happen. And meanwhile, in spite of the rain, the crowds along the route Quite considerable. You've done it before. Yeah. Cutty Sark, uh, the special ramp built, built there. They leave the main road and just run round the Cutty Sark. And the time at five miles, 23 minutes, 53 seconds. And uh, it's a very even pace indeed. 4.45 the first mile, then 4.53, 4.44, 4.40, 4.56. Still got a long wait at uh, Tower Bridge, which is the 12 mile mark. But very patient, and the athletes will appreciate the sort of encouragement they're bound to get. And there we are, right back with the leading group, Malcolm East, who's, who's taking his time to get there. But I thought what was quite interesting was they, they sped up one of the miles and they just slowed down again and the whole group has just come together. So all the main contenders, all the people whose names we've talked about, Dave Cannon and Mike Grattan and Malcolm East and Graham Lang from Scotland. They're all there, they're all watching the pace. They know that they've just got to conserve energy at this point in time. They know there's nothing serious happening up front. If the Ethiopians had made a move, they probably would have let them go because they would know that if they're running at 4.45 or 4.50 pace, that's well fast enough to contend. Just spot some of the numbers for you there. 
Uh, number 26 is Graham Lang of Scotland, well-known distance runner. 120 Ortega looks very strong indeed, the Spaniard. Uh, nine is Malcolm East, number 32, lives in America. Uh, British-born, though, and a very experienced marathon athlete. Two Cottimans, 39, Jerry Helm, St. Helens. There with the beard is Jim Dingwall. Also uh, up with the leaders. Looks like uh, David Clark of uh, Scotland. 206 is Ray Crabb of Bristol. Uh, Mike Gretton up with the leaders. He was third in the Commonwealth Games and, of course, third in this race last year. Mike Gretton wearing number 12. Just checking on the form of these Ethiopians. Um, Balshu wears 82, has done uh, 2 hours 11 minutes. Very, very useful indeed. Um, one of the fascinating athletes is number 85, is that with the leading group, Hinda Kume, uh, who was fourth in the uh, International Junior Cross Country Championship last year, but no marathon form at all. But they pitched them in very young, Brendan. That's right, and they, they know exactly how to do it. I mean, we, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him up there, because we saw his junior compadre win the World Cross Country, and we hadn't had any form from him except for the, the junior the year before. But I look at Putterman, he's in the lead, he's looking over his shoulder again, he's obviously nervous, he's starting to step up the pace a little, because he doesn't enjoy running with people around him. He likes to whittle the, the field down to three or four, so that he then can concentrate on his own race. But he, you know, as I say, he's glancing down at, at either foot, at either side, and then he's just being tracked by those three Ethiopians. Putterman appears to be surging as they're now approaching uh, the Royal Naval College. What a lovely sight that is. The gap there, in order for the view not to be spoiled of the Thames from Queen's House. That is just before Cutty Sark, where they leave the main road and run around the cutter. It looks actually uh, as if that surge is starting to slow down, but there are four with about a ten-yard gap, and Puddyman's weaving all over the road. That's right, when he set off, he put a little bit of a burst in, but they tracked him, and he wasn't very happy that they just sat right behind him, so now he's messing around, he's, he's zigzagging across the road. As I said, he's been looking over his shoulder all the way. I don't know why he doesn't, doesn't look, just step behind him so he can look over his shoulder and see them in front of him, but no, he's got, he's got that, that funny idea that he's got to be in the front, he's got to be competing from this early on, and there really isn't any need for it. I mean, that was an absolute waste of energy because they've now been caught by the main group, and they've wasted their energy in doing so. Actually, coming across the near side to uh, collect some uh, liquid is Graham Lang of Scotland. Good view of the feeding station uh, routine there. And over half a million cups out on the course. And a feeding station from here on every mile. Liquid absolutely vital, even on a wet day like this, because the runners over this long distance suffer at the latest stages of dehydration. It's important that they take drinks, even though it's damp and even though it's not too warm, and even though they're probably not feeling thirsty, they should take the drinks before they actually have the onset of, um, of thirst, because otherwise they're going to get caught up late in the later stages through lack of, lack of water, lack of hydration. And they reassemble there after that little interlude at the feeding stations and the groups back together again. Half of them didn't drink and half of them did drink. I think it's more sensible that they do. But they're all over the road again. They're, they're cutting from one side to the other. And the, 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 the more sensible ones are the ones who are just laying off the group and just sitting at the back of the group and not getting involved with this, this messing about. Well, there, the signal that the leaders are approaching, Cutty Sark. Just passing the Royal Naval College and Queen's House, and that is at about six miles. Extraordinary behaviour by Puttimans for an athlete of his quality and experience, though. The way he's been wandering about. Certainly he resents the Africans not sharing the pacemaking, but he's wasting valuable energy himself. I don't think he should have bothered with all that because he could have just stayed in the group with the rest of the athletes and just got a nice, gentle, comfortable ride along and not, and not had to get in, in any concern in his mind about anything other than getting to the 20-mile mark, getting there in a good, good condition, 
so that he can then concentrate on the major part of the race, which is between 20 and 26 miles. Number 31 there showing on the outside. Ian Ray, experienced uh, international marathon runner in Salisbury. And so they swing now into sight of the Cuddy Sock. Making this slight detour to take in uh, this famous landmark. And I say landmark uh, because it's not actually in the water. Well, quite a competitive leading group here. Nobody's really made any real impact. One remembers 12 months ago at this stage, Graham Tuck alongside uh, Hugh Jones were well away and the race was almost over. 206 Ray Crabb, uh, 23 there is uh, Paul Eels at Windsor Slough Eaton. So they go round the cutter, which a century ago held all the records for speed and endurance. And certainly the time suggests that the uh, fastest marathon ever run in the United Kingdom, which was on this course 12 months ago, is going to be tested today. That was by Hugh Jones when he clocked uh, just over two He's hours. streaming through minutes. just after the 12-mile mark. But meanwhile, way ahead of these runners, the leading group fighting it out at a very fast pace indeed. In fact, on target for one of the fastest marathons ever run in this country. A short time ago, the three Africans, that's Kume, Makila and Bolsha of Ethiopia, Ortega of Spain, wearing number 120, and Puddimans of Belgium broke away. But in fact, they've been caught having passed the halfway stage in one hour, four minutes, ten seconds. Very fast indeed. Those were the leading group, but now they've been caught. But up there is Jim Dingwall in front. Uh, Jerry Helm is number 39. Number 82 is Bolsha of Ethiopia. Ortega, number 120, the All Red of Spain, with the group. Puttimans is there as well. And also Ray Crabb. And they're on the 16-mile marker. Going around the Isle of Dogs, and also with the leading group is Mike Grant. Meanwhile, we're having a magnificent run down the field by the leading girl, Greta Weitz, the favourite of the ladies' race from Norway. And she is certainly on target for a new world record, wearing one, and alongside her, her brother, Jan Handersen, who's obviously pacing her and staying with her all the way. And in fact, Anderson is slightly slower than Greta Weitz, some two and a half minutes slower over the marathon distance. And we recorded that some uh, two, three minutes ago. There's a lot of those on the course, come on, Danny. And a tremendous crowd has turned out. The rain has lessened, in fact, but there's tremendous spirit at the back when the, uh, the, the, the three, four and five hour runners uh, are coming through. They're uh, waving to every camera. They're being cheered and lifted. There's a lovely euphoria that there's always been in the London Marathon. And, uh, and a lot of these fellows trying to stay with the, uh, with the ladies as they're running. There's, uh, there's a good race up front. That's one of her older brothers, Greta Weitz. She's got two brothers. They both run the marathon. Both of them are slower than her at her best. So at some stage, we expect her to break away from her brother. Meanwhile, in second place in the ladies' race is Mary O'Connor of New Zealand, who's running way ahead of her best time. Her best time's two hours, 44 minutes, but at the moment she's on schedule for something inside two and a half hours. And in third place, by the way, in the ladies' race at Tarbridge is Cathy Brins of Sale Harriers and England. Back with the leading group now. We saw a dramatic change just after halfway when the leading group looked as though they were heading for a world record time, but I, I, I thought then they were going a bit quick, and now they've been caught by the group of Brit Britain leaders. I'm impressed with the Mike Gratton, who's running in all red. He's taken, he's taken everything cagely. He's just moved gradually towards the leading group, and we're only 16 miles now, so the race really is as yet to unfurl. But Mike Gratton, who was third in the Commonwealth Games, remember that remarkable race he had with Di Castella down there in Brisbane. Um, he's done everything right so far, and thankfully we've now got four Britons in the top in the leading group, which is great. The Isle of Dogs, and uh, that area hopefully is going to see uh, 
a resurgence of British athletics has plans to build an indoor training centre there and these marathon runners are going to help considerably because uh, by bringing attention to it and hopefully it may become one of the charities that they may run for. There's a real race boiling up. At one stage they were 12 seconds ahead of, of the time that was run last year they dropped about 10 seconds in that time the second bunch caught up with the leading bunch that was Puddemans leading the three Ethiopians and now a strong pack of English runners have uh, come together and this August well for the world championships in Helsinki remember in August the those inaugural championships and this is one heck of a race that's brewing up meanwhile the athletes still streaming over Tarbridge some four miles behind the shot of the colorful stream stretching back now for some six to seven miles meanwhile look at the scene of the mile this is a mile from the finish and <laughs> looking at palace in sight dance for your life group a keep fit group now this is it they're from somerset and that's a form of exercise that's grown just like the phenomenon of the marathon number of uh, women's groups that are doing this around the country and it looks as though it's doing them a world of good well, now from the uh, chasing uh, athletes look all looking for best times we rejoin the leaders with the news that they're right on schedule as last year one hour 18 minutes 32 seconds at 16 miles which in fact is exactly the same time as Hugh Jones 12 months ago just spotting the leaders there, 39 is Jerry Helm, St. Helens, number 12, Mike Grattan, who was third in this race last year, third in the Commonwealth Games. 120, just hidden by Grattan, is Ortega of Spain. Behind him, the bearded Jim Dingball from Scotland. And moving across the right, number two, Emil Cottimans of Belgium. 206 is Ray Crabb of Bristol. And also with that leading group is Balsha of Ethiopia. The other two Ethiopians, Bakila and Kume, having a very, very bad time after the early pace had broken. Bridge uh, packed with spectators. And now the bulk of the pack beginning to stream over the bridge. And in fact, they'll still be going over when the leaders come back from the Isle of Docks. Pass underneath the bridge. St. Catherine's Dock first, underneath the bridge, and then uh, through the Tower of London grounds itself. So just to recap on the leaders, Jerry Hull of England and St. Helens. Also there is uh, Mike Grattan of Invicta, Emil Puddimans of Belgium, Ray Crabb of Bristol, Jim Dingwall of Scotland, Ortega of Spain. That is the leading group. And the leaders in the women, Greta Weitz of Norway, on schedule for a new world record. In second place is Mary O'Connor of New Zealand. And in third place at the moment, Cathy Binns of Sale Harriers and England. Start of the London Marathon at 9.30 this morning. Some 18,000 runners, a world record figure, setting out on their journey of 26 miles, 385 yards, through the streets of London. And Big Ben showing they've now been on the way for almost two hours. And the leaders now within sight along the embankment of Big Ben itself, although they've still got three miles to go. Swinging up North Ambland Avenue through Trafalgar Square, and then along the mile, Birdcage Walk, and finishing at Westminster Bridge. In a moment, we'll pick up the leader, and it is Mike Grattan of Invicta, who was third last year and has just made the break in the grounds of the Tower of London to get away from Jerry Helm of St Helens. He's still uh, being chased by Helm, who's now some uh, 30 yards behind. Jerry Helm. He's won his last three marathons from St. Helens in Lancashire. Mike Grattan, coached by Cliff Temple, one of the most durable marathon athletes in the world. Third in the Commonwealth Games Championship, and behind the Australian Di Costello.
and really he wasn't panicked in the early stages when the pace was very, very fast indeed. In fact, at the halfway stage, they were almost on schedule, the leaders, three Africans and Perrimans of Belgium, uh, for a new world best time. But he slackened off after that, and certainly the Ethiopians and Perrimans have paid for the very fast early pace. The streets of London packed with cheering crowds, and once more, the marathon, even on a wet day, has brought them to the fireside. Helm still holding that distance of 25 to 30 metres and possibly still not beaten if Grattan Week. Along the embankment there, of course, you can see in the distance the welcome sight of Big Ben. But then he has to go on a loop up through Trafalgar Square, back along the Mall, Bird Cage Walk, and back past Big Ben to finish on the far side of Westminster Bridge. A very, very impressive piece of running by the two Englishmen. And they've got well away from Vulture of Ethiopia, who dropped off just before St Catherine's Dock at about 22 miles. Ron Pickering. Well, the rewards are going to be considerable for these two, Mike Grattan there and Jerry Helm. If they maintain this and come in one and two, they will be representing Great Britain at Helsinki. And the rewards, too, are financial because uh, nowadays there is a considerable reward. We'll go into a prize fund for them to, uh, uh, to support them in, uh, after their athletic days are over. And that's important because Mike Grattan, a teacher who uh, recently taught at the Archbishop's School in Canterbury, has just uh, resigned as a teacher to become a full-time runner, formerly with Folkestone AC, then Brighton, now with Invicta, who are looking very strong in the team race because many of the clubs have got teams out of four runners three of whom will count towards that team prize, their aggregate time will be taken. And he started his athletic career in the uh, English Schools Athletic uh, Championships, as many of them did. Three times he represented uh, his county in the 1500 metres, then he won the 5000 metres way back in 74. In 1977, he broke three bones in his foot and uh, was out for a, good, uh, for a good while. He's becoming steadily improving since then. Late choice for the Commonwealth, third place, been recently doing 120 miles a week in training and uh, delighted that the uh, that it's raining and not sunny because he's one of the sufferers from hay fever. Mike Grattan, the leader. Just going on the Waterloo Bridge and by the way, Mike Grattan is on the way possibly to the fastest marathon ever run in this country. The best time was set by Hugh Jones on this course last year, but as they passed 24 miles, he was about um, 15 seconds within that record. Brendan Foster. Well, I noticed when he went past 24 miles, he checked his own watch, so he'll, he'll know exactly what he has to do over the last two miles to uh, collect that fastest time. And he'll be conscious of it because he's prepared religiously for this race. He, he ran a great race in the Commonwealth Games back in October of last year, where he took a bronze medal. And, he ha and he's done nothing other than prepare for this race. And knowing Mike and knowing his coach, Cliff Temple, they'll, they'll have talked this one through. They'll have decided exactly what they want from this race. And he's already on, way to, on the way to doing that. I'm really impressed with his, with his form. He did everything right in the race. He, did, he let the leaders go and he didn't close up on them until he was ready to do that. And he looks as though he's going to take the reward for his, for his considerable amount of training. The range of ability, quite remarkable in this field. Grattan now approaching 25 miles. And meanwhile at the tower, the fun runners just going through there, some 13 miles behind. And still they're streaming through. And by the way, the news of the ladies' race is that Greta Weitz is leading from Norway, the World Cross Country Champion, and on schedule at the moment for a new world best. She's got to beat two hours, 25 minutes, 29 seconds, set by Alison Rowe of New Zealand. Um, Mary O'Connor of New Zealand in second place, and Deirdre Nagel of uh, Ireland is third. First English girl is Cathy Bins in fifth place. Mike Grattan now approaching Trafalgar Square. And Jerry Helm just cannot close that gap, maintaining about the same difference. But in fact, once the break had been made, as happened so often, he just cannot close it. Mike Grattan brushing away the offers of a drink and really opening up that gap, although Jerry Helm must be congratulated because he's about four minutes inside his best ever time. He's had some good wins, the man in second place, 
a winner at Aberdeen, a winner in North Wales, a winner in Florida. He's won three marathons, but Mike Grattan has paced himself so remarkably well. His first marathon he ever run, the Assam, two hours, 22.9, and here he is going for the fastest time ever run by, uh, in Britain by a British marathon. And the crowd will love this because this is a London occasion. It really is a capital occasion, and they want to see an England winner come through. Just uh, a reminder of the leading girl, Greta Voits, uh, going to St Catherine's Dock, uh, which is about uh, 22 miles and just over two hours, two minutes. And indeed, if she can keep going at this sort of pace, she's uh, lost her brother, by the way, who was pacemaking with her, Jan Anderson. Um, if she can keep at this pace, she could run the fastest time ever in the world by a woman. Meanwhile, the leader is now in the mall. Having uh, passed under Admiralty Arch in the background, and uh, he's querying something there, he didn't quite know which way to go. And I know why that is, because the vehicles are not allowed along there, the lead vehicles. The vehicles cut off and turned left there, and I think uh, Mike Grant, in spite of having run this course last year, was making absolutely sure he got it right. So many marathon runners in the closing stages have uh, made mistakes through tiredness, and he certainly didn't want to do that. But he's experienced, knows the course, and Jerry Helm, by the way, seems to be still in contention. The gap is not all that big. I think we still have a bit of a race because they have about two, 2,000 metres to go. That's just over a mile and a quarter. And they are coming down the mile. They, they had that little bit of disturbance there about exactly which way they were going to go. But as, as we come in closer, they've got to turn left at the top of the mile. That must be one of the most pleasant experiences of, for any athlete to run down the mile, having, having done 25 miles there of the London Marathon and be received with a, such a crowd as there is. And Malcolm East there going through there to enjoy the, the support. So... Actually, that's a, a runner who's appearing in the picture for the first time. Number 70 is Jorgensen of Denmark, who hasn't been with the leaders. I'm not quite sure where he's placed. But Greta Weitz on her way. Past Traders Gate. That's Mary O'Connor of New Zealand, who's running the race of her life in second place. She got the best time uh, before this race of 2 hours 44, on the way over the Dutch Bridge at St Catherine's Dock, and looking very strong. Yeah. Don't get a cue like Ricky. That's the group chasing the leaders. In fact, uh, Mike Grattan, the leader, should be on the way now towards Birdcage Walk. Grattan looking so powerful and so relaxed as well. Still Jerry Helm in second place, but losing ground now as Grant turns in front of the Queen Victoria Memorial and Buckingham Palace. On towards Australia Gate. And entering the final half mile. This is a really impressive run by Mike Grattan, and he's, he's probably still pushing on because he knows he can run faster than last year's time if he just keeps it going. Because he's been checking his watch all the way, and it, as, as I said earlier, he's prepared only for this race, so he'll want a time out of it, and he's, he's heading for that at the moment. He's taking on the support of all the spectators, and he's really enjoying the last mile or so of this race. Well, looking at that time, he's running quite a remarkable race. Uh, the course record set by Hugh Jones last year, at two hours, nine minutes, 24 seconds, and surely that's going to be broken. And that was the fastest ever marathon in the UK. But in fact, the world's fastest ever time was by De Costello of Australia, at two hours, eight minutes, 37 seconds. And he could be close to that if he can keep going. He's certainly got a little bit of running to do to catch that world's best time by De Costello, but he's, he knows how fast he's got to go. 
I think you've got to remember how good Jerry Helms run. He's run won three marathons in the last six months, but he's never ever run as impressively as this. And it's a great run in second place, and it's a great day for British distance running to have first and second in this the London Marathon. Actually, the time I gave you before the, the season's fastest, set in Rotterdam last week by Dick Costello, the all-time ranking list shows Salazar of America in front, two hours, eight minutes, 13 seconds. Looks as if uh, Grattan might just miss that, but his real target, of course, is going to be a British best. Well, Mike Grattan's, uh, there's the uh, first of the Ethiopians, but Mike Grattan made his name through running very good 10 miles on the road, the Tunbridge 10, the Worthing 10, the Faversham 5, and 17 miles, and he's gradually progressed through to the marathon, and he's timed this beautifully. What a good representative, and the number one and two uh, that we'll have in Helsinki. Remember, we've still got the choice of Hugh Jones and a whole number of others to take three to Helsinki, and our marathon uh, strength index is looking as good as it's ever been. Notice Bolshev of Ethiopia, who was up the pound with the leaders for so long, they're back uh, in fifth or sixth place. And Grattan, breasting the hill, so close to Big Ben, and the finish on Westminster Bridge. Marvellous reception and a superb run. The best ever run in the marathon distance by a UK runner was Ian Thompson in 1974. Two hours, nine minutes and 12 seconds. And Grattan has the finish in sight. Not surprisingly, but be a little heavy. And Jerry Helm in second place. Really driving himself forward. And he'll miss uh, Ian Thompson's uh, fastest time ever by a British athlete and maybe slightly slower than Hugh Jones last year. That was two hours, nine minutes, 24 seconds. Certainly, and not surprisingly, he's finding this closing uh, half-mile pretty tough. But now, inspired by the crowd, he's picking up pace again. And so, with 100 metres to go, Mike Grattan of Invicta and England runs his way to winning the London Marathon, his first really major victory. His time just outside the record for the course. In second place, Jerry Helm of St Helens. Winner of three marathons in the first 12 months and running a lifetime best. His previous best, some four minutes slow. And those two, certain to go now to the World Championships in Helsinki. Now, who's going to be third is the next question. That looks like Balsha of Ethiopia, but ahead of him, and this athlete has come from absolutely nowhere. He's not been with the leading group at all. And it looks like Jorgensen of Denmark. Come through very late indeed. His best previous time was 2 hours 17. And he's really taken that apart. So Jorgensen of Denmark through was very, very fast running. in the closing stages. We've not seen him in touch with the leaders at any stage in the race. And in uh, fourth place, I thought I saw in the background there the tiny figure of Balcha of Ethiopia. So long with the leaders. And Jim Dingwall of Scotland in fifth place. That's a fine run by him. Balcha whose best time is 2 hours 11 minutes, won the Montreal Marathon in 79-81, uh, but broken when he was really attacked, uh, with four miles to go by the two uh, Britons. So Balsha through, 
in fourth place. Jim Dingwall with what is certainly a personal best time comes through to finish fifth. That's Ortega of Spain in sixth place. He too was with the leading group a long time. And there, coming through late, was Martin McCarthy of Oxford City. Looks like the familiar figure of Trevor Wright in the white. And Emil Puddivans of Belgium racing in for the line. And Wright looks across. Trevor Wright, I think, finished third in this race two years ago. Now lives in New Zealand. So Puttimans, who was forcing the pace in the early stages, paid for that, just beats Wright to the line. And by the way, uh, Trevor Wright's wife, Rosemary, the former Commonwealth 800 meter champion, is also in this uh, London Marathon. That's Dahl of Norway, who was second last year. It's time, 2 hours, 12 minutes, 42. It's a fraction slower than last year. Dave Cannon, uh, Brendan Foster's clubmate at Gateshead, one of our international uh, athletes of last year. Dave Clark, Scotsman. Well, a lot of interest now, of course, uh, in the first girl home, and that promises to be Greta Weitz of Norway, the world cross-country champion. The aim for her will be a new world best time inside at 2 hours 25 uh, minutes 29 seconds. That was set by Alison Rowe. And that car, by the way, should be leading the first girl runner. And Greta Weitz, wearing number one, is there on the left of the picture. Pace for so long, by her brother, Gianna Anderson. But uh, he's some uh, two to three minutes slower than Greta, and uh, she dropped him at about 17 miles. The only marathon runner, I think, that would have been discovered by a 300-foot javelin thrower. The great Terje Pedersen, the world's first 300-foot thrower, discovered Greta Anderson as a young 14-year-old girl in the village in which she lived and suggested she took up the sport. And what a favourite she is in Britain, and what a reception she's going to get now 29 she outranks in popularity and prestige most of the world's top male runners the reigning world cross-country champion five times the winner four times in succession and three times has broken the world marathon best for women all in the new york marathon this is the first time we've attracted her here we've been waiting for her to come but she's going to get the most tremendous reception husband jack her coach and constant companion he'll be waiting at the finish for her and she's coached by a Czechoslovakian refugee who was a former decathlete, Edward Stobler. But the world uh, pays recognition to this girl. She's put uh, new boundaries to 5,000 metres, 10,000 metres and marathon running. She's put women's marathon running on the map. And, uh, and if she gets that world record back from Alison Rowe, no one will begrudge her. Entering the last uh, mile now of the race. A time uh, of one mile, 385 yards to go, was almost dead on, two hours, 19 minutes. She's got about six minutes to uh, run these closing stages in to set a new world best. So, from the unusual to the expected. Greta Weitz always the favourite for this race. She's had some knee trouble, by the way, after the World Cross Country Championship. But uh, she was telling me yesterday it hasn't affected her a great deal. It certainly hasn't affected her training. That's the second girl, and she's running way ahead of her best form, Mary O'Connor from New Zealand. Looking at both Greta Weitz and Mary O'Connor, you've got to realise that they're, they're running amongst some of the some good club runners in Britain, some men who train, you know, 15, 17 miles a day, who run 100 miles a week or more, and who are considered in their own areas as being good club runners. Because 2.25 is an excellent time for the marathon. It just shows you how good she is, because I'm recognising some of the lads around her who are, uh, who are good distance runners. Uh, Greta Weitz looked to be well on target at halfway for a new world best time. But in fact, I suspect, although she seems to be going quite well in these closing stages, quite evenly, she has slowed. 
She's going to be very, very close to that time, but she's not exactly uh, in control at the moment because she's got to weave in and out of some of those runners who are getting in her way. And she's got some... She'd have to really get her head down and start pounding the last mile if she's going to be close to that world record. Birdcage walk. Just uh, a little between a half a mile and three quarters of a mile to go. Oh, the great thing for Greta Weitz is the reward that uh, women's marathon running is now being recognised at world level. And there is a race for them in the inaugural World Championships in Helsinki. And it's great, too, that she's recovering from her first ever bad season was last year. She had a bad year when she lost both the cross-country world championship. She lost to Marachicha Puicha and uh, lost her world marathon record time to Alison Rowe. Now, that time may still survive, but, uh, but no one would deny her that uh, at last her stage, her arena may well be in Helsinki and the Scandinavians will love it. She's uh, Norway's outstanding athlete and, uh, and if she go, when she goes to Helsinki she may well make that the last race of her tremendous career. She's certainly moving very well indeed. Encouraged by the side of the finish. And she's going to be very, very close, as she well knows, to that world best time. Meanwhile, not all the competitors moving so well as we join Bob Wilson. Well, actually, we were hoping to pick up uh, Bob Wilson, but uh, we can stay instead for a glimpse of one of the great marathon runners of all time, Ron Hill. This is his 70th marathon, Ron Hill. And uh, he's run the equivalent in racing terms of four times around the world. Now a vet, I think Ron's, what, 42? And his 70th marathon. Uh, tremendous record, European Championships and Commonwealth Games. And another man that's been responsible for putting marathon running on the map. Spans a great career and rightly wears the number one. Ron Hill from Bolton. PhD, Dr. Ron Hill. He's a textile engineer, but really he ought to have a PhD for marathon running. He really is one of the most respected runners in the world. Still waiting for Greta Weitz to come within uh, sight of the finish. There's no doubt that the second girl, by the way, uh, Mary O'Connor, is going to run a very fast marathon indeed. She to... Uh, Connor is now in birdcage walk. Everyone waiting for the appearance of Greta Weitz. It will be channeled into a special phone at the finish of the ladies' race. It's going to be very close, but uh, she's got about a minute left in which to break. Alison Rose, world best time of two hours, 25 minutes, 29 seconds. She really knows exactly what she's doing. The clock is in sight. Greta, not only a great athlete, but a great student of long distance life. She's really striding up full of uh, life. Two hours, 25 minutes, 29 seconds to beat for a new world best. She's got to be tantalisingly close. Comes across the road for the separate finish for the ladies. And she's been waved across into the finishing funnel. And is she going to break that top? Two hours, 25, 29 to beat. Oh, it's so close, and she knows it too. 26 miles, 385 yards, she's beaten the world best time by a single second. What a marvellous run, what a marvellous performance, but you, you, you know why we said it was close, because all the way along she was on schedule, but just on schedule for that time. But what a marvellous run, it must, it's going to be down to the tenth of the second, but it looks as though she's actually done it. Tremendous performance. She had everything going for her with the conditions today, and just one or two of those athletes got in the way over the last half a mile, and she was... Uh, it was, it was quite frightening. 
So from Greta White uh, winning the women's race, we can now join the winner of the men's race, Mike Grattan, talking to Desmond Heinem. Thanks, David. Many congratulations, Mike. You look comfortable all the way. Um, I didn't feel comfortable. I must admit, I was a bit worried at halfway that they're going away and they wouldn't come back. But in the end, my pace judgment proved right. A third last year, wasn't yes, it? That's right. So a distinct improvement. Yes, two minutes, almost two minutes, I think. So. Were you happy with the time? Very, more than happy with the time, I think. I was aiming at around 2.10, so to get under 2.10 makes me a world-class athlete at last. You so. seem to have recovered well. Um, you do when you've won. I think if I'd been third or fourth, I might not have recovered so quickly. <laughs> what were conditions like out there for it this morning, in your opinion? Um, they were very cool, very comfortable for marathon running. A little bit windy on the way back in, in patches, but not too bad otherwise. What sort of preparation did you put in for this? Um, well, I've trained an average of 110 miles over the last 15, 20 weeks, so, um, plus obviously years and years of background. Yeah. But I've trained harder for this race than I did even for the Commonwealth Games last year. And any family here watching you today? Um, my brother's around somewhere, I don't think he's here, and girlfriend's over there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they'll, they'll be searching for me in a few moments. And a nice moment for you as you, as you came in there. Tremendous welcome. Yes, yes, very pleased. It's, the last two miles, the crowd were delightful. It just lifts you completely. And, uh, and all the way through, I would imagine. Um, yes, it's a bit patchy when the island dogs, a bit lonely, but then you're in the group. But you, know, you need it in the last two miles when you're starting to feel very, very tired. Now, this means, of course, the World Championship for you. That's it? right, I was thinking. Yeah. And that's what really matters. Yes, that's right. Doing well there. If I repeat that time there, then I'm in for a medal, I think. Well, do you like competing in this kind of event, you know, which is a sort of uh, event for everybody compared to a, a pure marathon? Um, it was very nerve-wracking being on home ground and being dubbed the favourite before. I didn't know quite how to handle it. Um, it's easier than running, say, Commonwealth Games where you've only got 20 or 30 athletes of very high calibre. And if you get tailed off in that situation, then you're, you're lost. But here you've got so many runners early on to run with. It's, you never get that position where you, you feel that like you've been dropped. Well done, Mike. Many congratulations. Thanks,